And making optimal use of what he has allowed us to be and to do for him in testimony and service until he come. That really is a good focus for us. And I think this passage in John 4 will help us in that regard. We, we've looked at the first 26 verses last time and this interchange at the well of Sychar, they're near Shechem, between Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. You remember that was where the blessings and cursings of the law were read twice in Joshua, where they gathered. You remember the priests and and on the both mountains, and one in a, in a symphonic kind of refrain, they read those blessings and cursings of Deuteronomy 28 and echoed back from the, it, it must have been something because they're down in the valley and it's kind of a natural theater. They didn't have to have microphones. <laughs> they could hear each other. It, and then of course the Lord designed that valley. He knew what he was gonna do in that valley so many years later. But here we have in these first 26 verses, we might, we might say the most, the Lord interviews an ignoble woman and at the last of chapter 4, he interviews a noble man of Galilee. So we have the ignoble woman. I say ignoble because in that day, she would have been regarded that way, not because of anything today. But in that day, she was a woman. She had uh, five husbands, and she was with one she wasn't married to, and she was a Samaritan. And so in the Jews' eyes, she would have been looked at as way down the social rank and ladder. But then at the end of the chapter, then it's a nobleman comes in from Capernaum up to Cana. And I think it, you can't miss the, the stratagems of our Lord. And that's one of the dynamics. We're, we're looking at the Gospel of John carefully and in the idea of as we have opportunity to share the Gospel this year, you know, some of us like to use the Romans road. And that's a favorite of mine. I'll generally use that. But we want to be flexible, of course, how the Lord guides us in sharing the gospel with a stranger or with someone we know. Either way, but the gospel of John has, is a rich tool in that regard. Each chapter, we're seeing that. You could use any of the, the uh, 21 chapters, and, and that's what we're trying to do as we work through it. We're going to begin in verse 27 down through verse 54, the second half of chapter 4, and it, it will in turn set up chapter 5 and that great discourse, that first long discourse in the uh, Gospel of John. And, and so I, I, as I divide up this section, uh, help us think through it, in verses 27 to 30, we see then that the woman invites others to the Lord. Do we invite others to the Lord, right? She invites others to the Lord, having been convinced of his identity. And then we see in verses 31 to 38, a great lesson from the Lord to his disciples on what it is to do God's will. Doing God's will. In this present era, this present age that we're in. And then in verses 39 to 42, John comes back to Sychar, so he's using what the literary tool of interchange, we call it, where he moves, he starts with the woman, he moves then to the disciples and their you know, interaction with the Lord and then comes back to the woman and the people of Sychar in Samaria there. And then in verses 43 to 54, this interchange with the nobleman of Capernaum and the healing of his son. I, as I say, and, I, and I'll try to point this out, there are seven principles just in this section alone that are very rich, that still have application to us even today. Oh, there's that good Louisiana rain. And so we pick up then in verse 27 with, uh, remember verse 26 is a staggering statement. 
one of the clearest statements of the identity of the Lord Jesus, and it's not to Nicodemus, and it's not to the man at the pool of Bethesda, and it's not to the people at the feeding of the 5,000, it's to this poor lost woman of Samaria. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. The, what we call the ego a me. In the Greek it's ego a me, I am who speak to you. <laughs> the I am, the Jehovah of the Old Testament, that's what the I am means. He says, Jehovah, the Lord Jesus is speaking to you. <laughs> well, what's she going to do with that information? Now she has some information. Remember they had this discussion about religion and then he got on the subject of her lifestyle and then she want to get off that subject and she moved into, well, let's talk about worship for a while and talk about Mount Gerizim. Let's get off of the subject of my uh, failures here and weaknesses. <laughs> but what he did in pointing out this problem in her, her morality problem was part of what convinced her of who he was, you see. And that appears twice in this section. So, verse 27, and at this point, <laughs> at the very point where he's sitting there and he says, I who speak to you am he, and suddenly the camera pans away as it were, and here comes the 12. And they've been to Subway to get a, some sandwiches and they're coming back to help our Lord get some food because he's hungry, see, on his journey. So at this point, his disciples came and they marveled that he talked with a woman. <laughs> Why would they marvel? Well, because this, the issue of holiness, for one, and he being single, and you know, we're still, we're, 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 we try to be careful about that. But the Lord hadn't, and this is in the early part of his ministry, he hadn't had interaction with, he's by himself with this woman at the well. So they're, they kind of go, whoa. You know? And yet no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? Because they're marveling so much. And then that great statement in verse 28, by the way, have you left your water pots? <laughs> Have you left the water pots of the old life and all the old ways to get fulfillment? She had come to that well with her water pots. Why? To get refreshed. To get water to refresh her soul. But she got the water of life instead, you see. And, and I love that. So the woman left her water pot. <laughs> That's not important now. What's more important is who this person is I'm talking to and that others might know him. So... She made her, made her way into the city and said to the men, and apparently this would be the men, probably in, in the council, the leadership men, and, and they knew her, and she knew them, and so there was a level of influence apparently that she had despite all her problems, and, and she says, come, see a man who told me all things that I ever did. This is the invitation. You see, once we come to know the Lord Jesus as Savior, the Lord wants to use us to invite others to Him. And one of the best tools we can use or He can use in us is our own conversion testimony. If we're believers, if we're born again, we have a testimony, don't we? We have a conversion testimony, and, and, that's, what, and this, that's repeated to uh, this statement uh, about her being told, because in verse 39, again, when the Samaritans come out, they, they say, we came out and, and believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all that I ever did. Twice in the Greek, it's word for word the same in this little section. And you remember, when he told her everything she ever did, she said, Sir, I perceive you are a prophet. <laughs> you've got some special insight here because you've never met me before. You've never been to this town as far as I know. And you know all these details of my life that spanned over years. She couldn't have been married to five husbands without it taking at least some measure. It wasn't a few months to do all that. <clears throat> In other words, why was she so amazed? Well, I think of it this way. There could be more than one way to think of this. But I think she's amazed. She recognizes his omniscience. 
There's only one person that's omniscient. It's Jehovah God. But she also recognized, even though he knew everything about her, he was merciful, not judgmental. It's worth while sometimes to think of Psalm 139. You might just lodge that in the back of your mind because it's a fascinating psalm of David where he talks about, you know, where can I go from your presence, Lord? And he, he talks in six different directions. You can go north, south, east, west. That's four directions. And you can go up into the heavens. That's five. You can go down to the center of the earth. That's six. And then he mentions a seventh one. Oh, yeah, my heart. <laughs> Search me and know my heart and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. In other words, being transparent before the Lord. That's what's really good in our quiet time. When we, it's a great way to start the day. It's a good way to end the day too. But a good way to, to reflect on who we are before. He, he knows everything about us and he isn't judging us. That's what I think she was she said, you're going to be merciful with me? It touched her heart, see. And it touched the hearts of the people of the town. She said, come and see a man who told me, I like that, a man. <laughs> he's a man, but he's more than a man too, isn't he? Come see a man who told me all things I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? Could this be the Christ? See, she's, she's working it through. And by the way, beloved, uh, that's another thing. Give people time to process the information. He did, he did that with us, you know. Mm. When we're sharing, that's a big thing. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, the Lord says, Come, let us reason together. Let me reason this out. I want you to understand faith is rooted in fact. It's rooted in reality. It's not a leap in the dark. And so we give people time, and the Lord gives them time. And so what did they do? Verse 30, so they went out of the city and came to him. <laughs> they were now curious too. And, and then in the meantime, verse 31, the camera shifts to the disciples. Coming from Subway with the sandwiches. In the meantime, his disciples urged him saying, Rabbi, eat. Now I love this. Now here we're seeing the demonstration of purposeful obedience to the Lord, how to please God from the Lord's Son himself. What is Jesus' attitude toward work and ministry? This is, where, this is one of the key passages we have in the New Testament. In the meantime, they say to him, eat. And he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. And we don't know this kind of food either. <laughs> we're all, we're, we're getting there, hopefully. We're a work in progress, but we don't have the kind of obedience he's about to describe here. But they're, they're still thinking physically. Remember our Lord? I mean, the woman started off thinking physically too, and he led her into thinking of spiritual things. When you and I are sharing the gospel with someone, realize they're thinking on the physical, material world plane. That's all they know. That's all they have until they're born again. They, that, they can't leave that. So assume that's where they are when you start with them and lead them to where the Lord wants them to be. And so they think in verse 33, well, someone must have brought him something. Has anyone brought him anything to eat? Somebody beat us to it. Maybe they brought him a pizza before we could get back from Subway. How, how did this happen? And then this great statement, verse 34, one of the great statements of our Lord in the Gospel of John. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. More important to me than my physical food. More important to me than anything in this physical realm, says the Lord Jesus. Is to finish the work God has given me to do. To finish my mission on earth. Wow. Is that true of you and me? <laughs> We fall way short of that, don't we? I speak, I'm putting myself, I said we, I'm not picking on you. 
<laughs> this is a tall order, but isn't it fair to say this is what our Lord wants us to move more towards? That a mature Christian is going to move closer to this characteristic where whatever, you know, I've got to take care of insurance and I've got a house and I've got a this and then my kids are old enough, I've got to help them with school and I've got to, their homework and I've got these things, I've got to take care of the car because we use it to go here and there and, and I've got my work and I've got all these different things. But my focus... My central focus is to the, do the will of him, not who sent me in our case, but of him who saved me. <laughs> do you realize if you're born again, you have a specific mission from the king of kings? And he's going to hold you accountable for it at the Bema, at the judgment seat of Christ. That's sobering to think about. But God wants us to start thinking about that now because it'll change our priorities and our perspective. If you're born again, if you're a child of God, you have a specific service mission. I mean, there's a calling to salvation, and if you're born again, you've already met that. But then there's a calling to service, and each one of us has a calling in that area, and it's unique, and it's different, and it's specific to how he made us and how he gifted us with a spiritual gift. Wow. And nobody else can do that, that work that you're assigned to do. And nobody else will do that work. And if you don't do it, it won't get done. Now the Lord can meet other needs other ways, of course, because he's sovereign. But the very, no one else can do your assignment. Because no one else is you. <laughs> Uniquely made. That stands out in Psalm 139 also, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. I'm uniquely and wonderfully made. <laughs> so what a statement. <laughs> that alone, verse 34, the, the disciples, you know, should have, they probably fell backwards right then. <laughs> but uh, also, that this helps me to worship him. His attitude toward finish. If he didn't have that attitude, he may not have gone to the cross. <laughs> you see, he went all the way <laughs> to finish his father's work, even when it cost him a lot. Pain, humiliation, suffering of the cross. Aren't you glad he finished his work? <laughs> That's only one part of his work. He's performing a good work in you and me too, isn't he? According to Philippians 1, 6. He who had begun a good work in you shall perform it, shall finish it, shall complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. <laughs> I'm glad he's working on that work too. I don't want him to stop that work with me and I don't want him to stop that work with you. That's the whole sanctification. But then he moves into this issue of harvest. Now verse 35, oh, Evangelists love to camp out on this verse and wrench it out of its context, unfortunately. And, and it's, it's just a tendency that we have to want to proof text things. You know, they all, you know, look at the fields, they're white for harvest. Well, you and I don't know when fields are white for harvest, and neither does the evangelist. <laughs> we can't see the hearts. When the Lord Jesus said the fields were white for harvest, the people of Shechem were all marching out towards him. As we'll see in verse 39 and following, right? The people of the town are all coming out to hear him. And that's what he's saying here. He's saying, look, the fields are already white for harvest. He can see the hearts. We can't. An evangelist doesn't know if a field is white for harvest. They say, well, come on. You need to be involved in this kind of work of evangelism in Acadiana because the fields are white for harvest. Well, in one sense, the fields are always white for harvest, but he's not talking about that. He's talking about a specific harvest, isn't he? But he's trying to get his apostles to focus on the mission. He's already focused on it, right? In verse 34. So verse 35, do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? That tells us we think that he's probably at the time frame around Pentecost in May. And that would be the beginning, the first fruits of the harvest, right? And then the harvest would be completed in September in time for the Feast of Tabernacles and so forth. That was the harvest season. So there's still four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields for they are already white for harvest. And he probably gestured with his hand as he said that. Look, here they come. Look up there. They're all these people coming from Shechem. They're all marching out. They're white. They're ready to hear the gospel. Apostles, are you ready to tell them? 
powerful, huh? And then he gives us in verses 36 to 38 a marvelous picture of what he, Paul will also talk about in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, being workers together with one another and with God. Again, still focused on this issue of doing the Lord's will, doing his work, right? Verse 36, he who reaps receives wages. There's going to be a time of reward. That's the judgment seat of Christ. And he gathers fruit for eternal life. <laughs> fruit for eternity, not just fruit for now. <laughs> you gather fruit now, it's going to perish eventually, right? It only lasts so long, but fruit for eternity lasts for eternity. Well, what kind of fruit is he talking about? He's talking about eternal souls, isn't he? He's talking about leading people to Christ. And that he, both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. See, some people sow the gospel and some people reap the reap. What's he talking about? Someone has said that a person has to, I don't know how they calculated this, but I heard it on the radio some years ago. Someone has to hear the gospel 153 times before they'll, generally speaking, before they'll <laughs> come to know the Lord. Like I say, I don't know how they calculated it. Maybe they interviewed a lot of people. But in other words, you might be the 10th person to share the gospel with that person, or you may be the 152nd, and they didn't come to Christ. You said, ah, oh, why did they even bother? Poor old hardened heart, right? And then here comes along somebody, the 153rd person, and, the, and they respond to the gospel. They say, can I pray with you to receive Christ right now? <laughs> you ever been there when somebody said that? It's a special time. Oh, that's a, it's an eternal moment. Mm -hmm. And some of us get one of those in a whole lifetime, and some of us get a hundred of those in a lifetime, and that's up to the Lord. But you don't take attention to yourself. Don't say, well, Ma, you know, I must be a great evangelist because I was 153rd and mark that notch in your belt. You know, no, no, no. That's up to the Lord. And like he's saying, don't forget the 152 others that sowed the seed before you got there. You got the reward. And that's what he's telling the apostles here. He's saying, look, all these people are coming out from the town of Shechem to me and to you apostles to hear the gospel. But you didn't share the gospel with them. The Old Testament prophets have been sharing the gospel with them for hundreds of years. <laughs> Others sowed. You're going to reap, see. For in this, verse 37, the saying is true. One sows and another reaps. So take that burden off of yourself. I shared the gospel and they didn't answer and they didn't pray to receive Christ. And maybe if they prayed to receive Christ, they still weren't born again because they weren't explained the gospel carefully, right? And they may even still get saved 10 years later. That's happened too. I've talked to people like that. But I love this statement. Verse 38. I sent you to reap. Talking about them now, the apostles. I sent you to reap. And notice who sent them. Remember what he said of himself in verse 34, who sent the Lord Jesus? The Father. But now the Lord Jesus is sending the 12. I sent you to reap that for which you've not labored. You've never even been to Sychar. <laughs> you avoided Samaria every time all these feast days all through your life, you crossed the Jordan and came down the Decapolis. You avoided it. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labors. How does that fit, huh? Remember he says that they may rejoice together at the end of verse 36. The one who sows, the one who reaps, they're going to rejoice together because in the end, the work of the Lord got done when the person received Christ and had fruit for eternity. <laughs> Does it bother you that you're just a cog in the wheel? <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't bother me that, in fact, it helps us kind of demote all the pride a little bit. It kind of hopefully kills the pride in us that wants to say, boy, the Lord would never be able to do the work without me. <laughs> You've never thought that, but I've talked to people <laughs> I talk to people who practically talk that way. Wow, my ministry this and my ministry that. 
We had that down in uh, Hollywood, Florida. I love old Brother Hunter. Brother Hunter, old Scotman, and he's with the Lord now. But this, this one missionary had gone on about my ministry this and my ministry and with my ministry and our. And then when he got done, Brother Hunter said, thank you for telling us about the Lord's ministry, brother. <laughs> and it was just a silent Paul came over. <laughs> thank you for telling us about the Lord's work in you, brother. It's not your ministry, it's his. We're just a small part of it. I like to think of, you know, I have my small niche in the vineyard. You know, and you have your small niche in the vineyard. It's just a small niche, but it's still a niche in his vineyard. Don't, don't diminish that. <laughs> it's the vineyard of the king of kings. And that makes it special. So some reap, some sow, others have labored. And of course, in the immediate context, who's the biggest laborer of the others that have labored in these first three chapters of the Gospel of John? John the Baptist, right? Mm -hmm. Others have labored, and you've entered into their labors. Workers together with God. That's the phrase that the Apostle Paul uses in 1 Corinthians 3. Powerful way to think about ministry. So then we move on. The camera moves back. It had been with the women going into Shechem to get the people. Then it shifted back to the well with the disciples bringing their sandwiches to the Lord and his interchange with them. And then the camera moves back to Shechem in the outskirts. And look who's, what, look who's coming out to meet our Lord. In verse 30, And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him. Why? Because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all that I ever did. Now note this. What John's going to tell us here is there's a progression to their faith. Coming to know the Lord is a process. It will, there will when you're born again, that's, that's something that's instantaneous. At some point in that process, you're born again. But there was a lot that led up to it, and we're not aware of it at the time. We look back on it after we're saved, right? And there are a lot of different people God used and circumstances that God used. After I got saved, I mean, it took probably 10 years before I began to reflect in my quiet time on all the different people. Now, I've gone, by the Lord's grace, been able to go back and thank many of them. Some of them were gone. They were dead already. But some of them, I made it a point to go back and to, and to thank them. You know what, what you did that? Well, guess how it ended up? <laughs> so that they could rejoice together, right? And what the Lord's doing. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them in Samaria. Ah! <laughs> Those half-breeds said the Jews of Jerusalem, how could you you'd be defiled and contaminated? The Pharisees would walk around the whole territory of Samaria. You weren't allowed to go anywhere near it. You'd be defiled just to walk through it, they said. Of course, that's all superstition. The molecules and germs there on those roads are the same as they are in Judea. And so what did he do? Well, he stayed there two days. They wanted him to stay, and so he stayed. By the way, you ever thought about this in the contrast with the people of Kersey? <laughs> Kersey is the area where Legion lived. You remember? Legion, the man that, and the pigs. 2,000 of them, right? And, and you remember that what was the reaction of the people of that town? Depart from our coasts. And what did he do? Did he protest and say, don't you know who I am? No. He turned around and got in the boat. And that, that was the worst thing that could happen for the people of Kersey. They thought they had it bad with Legion. Wait, what's going to happen when they reject Jesus Christ when he's right there in their midst? But these people welcomed him. And so he stayed. You see how gentle our Lord is? He's not going to force himself. If you don't welcome him in, he's not going to come. He's not going to come in. I hope you treasure quiet moments with the Lord daily. 
Now, I know daily it's hard to find a quiet moment sometimes, some days, but you can find them. Find a place where you can meet with them and be quiet with them. In verse 41, and many more believed because of what? What brought them to faith in Christ first? The woman's testimony, right? Verse 39. Because of what you said, we came and believed in him. But now we have heard him in his own word. Now we don't get to hear him verbally, but how would, we, how would that apply today? Well, we hear the testimony of someone who's converted. And then hopefully we urge them to read the Gospel of John or some part of the Bible. And they read his own word and their faith is affirmed, you see. You see what I mean by process? And then they said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of what you said only, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. This is early on in his ministry. He hasn't even started the great Galilean ministry with three tours of Galilee. That hasn't even begun yet. John's taken us before that. And these Samaritans, people who, you know, they didn't go to the Jerusalem feast. They were outcasts in some respects. And they see him as the Savior, not just of Israel, but of the whole world. That's, that's a lot of insight, isn't it? And then John tells us this fascinating story, closes out the chapter of, of the nobleman. And he, he begins in verse 43. Now after the two days, he departed from there and went to Galilee. Now this picks up in chapter 4 of Matthew. I mean, we're only into chapter 4 of Matthew when we get to this point. And from, he'd gone to Galilee for Jesus himself testified... Oh, never forget this. A prophet has no honor in his own country. That's still true. People, wherever you got saved, people are going to, and then if you get called to a special work for the Lord, they're not going to believe it. They didn't with me. He's just that old Catholic. They got saved. The Lord can't use him. He couldn't be a Bible teacher, could he? <laughs> That's what they said down in Sugar Land. <laughs> but the Lord had different plans, didn't he? And he'll do that with every one of us. See? He says that statement in all four of the Gospels. The three synoptics, he says it in a different time in his ministry, but he says it here too. What's he talking about? He's talking about Nazareth, of course, where he grew up as a carpenter. He was 30 years old when he went into the ministry, so they had known him for his whole life, for 30 years. Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't this Mary and Joseph's son? He couldn't be a prophet. He's just a carpenter. <laughs> he couldn't be a prophet. He just sold cars. He couldn't, be, he couldn't be a Lord's servant now, could he? He was just an engineer. Engineers don't have any personality, right? That's what, that's what we're told. Couldn't have an engineer as a pastor of the Lord's people. They don't have any personality. They don't know people. They only know equipment. That's what I was told by some people. For Jesus himself testified that. So when he had come to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they also had gone to the feast. Remember, this is what we're recorded in chapter 2 and 3. So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee. You remember, that's chapter 2. That's the water turned to wine, where he had made the water wine. And here enters the scene, a need. And a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum was there. And when he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, out of Judea in the south, into Galilee in the north, he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son. For he was at the point of death. Now here's a picture of prayer. He's imploring the Lord for a need for someone else. This is what we call intercessory prayer. It's a great picture. But the Lord is not our errand boy, is he? 
And so how he answers our prayer will usually not be the way we thought it should be answered. The man, he says, I'm a nobleman, by the way, and I'm insisting that you come down and heal my son. Now, did the Lord say, yes, sir, I'm coming right now. Yes, sir. Is that what the Lord did? No. But he's also drawing the man out and stretching his faith, you see. He did it in the man's conversion. The Lord knows how to interact with people. And so Jesus said to him, wow, what a rebuke, huh? Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. What's he, what's he pointing out? You know, this to me is fascinating. This is a great verse for the sign. You remember the signs and wonders movement in the 1980s? Yeah, yeah some of you remember Started out in California, John Wimber and Jackie Deere. Jackie Deere used to teach at Dallas. And they taught, they started the Vineyard Church. There's still a lot of, is there a Vineyard Church in this area? We, we still have them around in Houston. And they taught, that you can check this out for yourself. They taught, unless you see signs and wonders occurring today in your church, you're not a New Testament church. And unless you see, they even took it further, unless you see signs and wonders, miracles happening in your life, you're not born again. And had I known then what I know now, just a baby Christian in the 1980s, I would have loved to have given them this verse. Unless you see signs and wonders, in another place the Lord will say, you know what? A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. <laughs> How do you think they would have taken that in Southern California, huh? Now, granted, I like some of the music that comes out of the Vineyard Church. You know, we, we hear it on the radio often, but let's make sure our theology is biblical, huh? Right. Our Lord says, what, what's our Lord rebuking them for? That faith is not sufficient unless you validate it with a miracle. Can you imagine telling God that? I'll believe in you. I've got your word. I've heard the gospel, and I believe in you, but you've got to give me a miracle. And unless you give me a miracle, I'm not going to believe in you. Well, then it's not faith, is it? Because now faith becomes sight. And we're demanding that from God, you see. So what's our Lord going to do in this situation? The, noble said, the nobleman said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. You can talk about theology, but my son's dying over here. <laughs> Signs and wonders, yeah, I know, but come down now. Well, what's the man thinking? He's forgetting that the Lord Jesus is Jehovah, and if he's Jehovah, not only is he omniscient, but he's omnipresent. He doesn't have to be there. He doesn't have to be there physically to save this, this young boy. So Jesus said to him, go your way. Move along. Your son lives. Now, the man is on the horns of a dilemma, right? Is he, should he stay there and keep begging on his knees and imploring? You need to, I'm not leaving here until you come with me. And by the way, it's down to Capernaum because Cana is up near Nazareth in the mountains and Capernaum is down on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. So you've got to go down to get to Capernaum. That's what he's saying. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him. Well, that's what the Samaritans had done, right? That's what everybody needs to do to be saved today, is to believe the word that Jesus says in the gospel. And he went his way. And as he was now going down, he's marching down toward Capernaum, his servants met him. By the way, he was a nobleman. He had servants. His servants met him and told him, saying, Your son lives. And so now, the Lord doesn't mind us examining to make sure the facts are right. We were talking about that, right, brother? You know, the testimony of two or three witnesses. The Lord's not afraid of our questions. And so the man says, okay, when did that happen, right? So as he was, then he inquired of them the hour when he got better. And they said to him, yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. Now they don't know this. The servants don't. But he's thinking in his head. That's the hour of the interview. 
<laughs> so the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said to him, your son lives, and he himself believed in his whole household. That is, he didn't believe for his household. He believed, and his whole household believed. People, you can't get saved for somebody else, right? Each individual has to come individually. And John wraps up this section. This, again, is the second sign Jesus did. This isn't the second miracle that Jesus ever did. By this point, as I said earlier, he's done many miracles. But in John's gospel, this is the second sign. What was the first sign? The water to wine also in Cana. And here's the second sign. The third sign will occur in chapter 5 and so forth. This is again the second sign Jesus did when he came out of Judea into Galilee. Okay, quickly then, what are the seven principles? Maybe you picked them up as we went along. First, in verse 29, come see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Invite others through the basis of your own testimony. Okay, use your testimony. You are a walking miracle if you're born again, and nobody can change that or take that away. You know that. If you're born again, you know it. And you know that that testimony bears evidence. It's one of the evidences of the gospel that God will use. Okay. Secondly, focus on your mission. Verse 34, right? Eventually, maybe it will get to the place where my food is to do the will of him who called me and to finish my course. Paul had that. So it wasn't just the Lord Jesus. Human beings can get to that place, but that's a high level of spiritual maturity, we have to admit. Thirdly, we're workers together. Verse 36 to 38. One sows and another one reaps. We enter into the labor of others. We're all in this together. This is not a competition. We're not in competition with each other. God forbid. There's too much of that talk among workers in the assemblies and in the churches today. There's too much of this competition stuff. Well, look at all the people I've got at my ministry. And look at all the people that so-and-so got. We're to compliment, not compete. Compliment with an E. Compliment each other and not compete. Great lesson. And then we saw in verse 42 how faith grows. You know, they started believing the testimony of the woman, then they heard the Lord Jesus, in other words, the scriptures, and then we know. <laughs> well, we know this is indeed the Christ. Fifthly, we see the whole issue of prayer in verse 47, imploring him to heal or to work in someone's life. It's a great privilege. Intercessory prayer. That's part of what we've been called to do. But we realize Christ is not our errand boy or the errand boy of anybody else. He'll stretch our faith. He may stretch the faith of the person we're imploring him for. And that's up to him. Okay? So don't demand an answer. <laughs> and don't demand it to be answered your way. And I'm saying that to myself, too, because I fall for this all the time. I just, you know, I mean, we get something, our imaginations are creative, and we begin to think, I know how he's going to answer this. He's going to do this, this, and this. And it never works out the way that I've thought about it, you know. But it does, he does answer. By the way, there's an answer sometimes yes, and there's an answer that sometimes no. Wait is also an answer. Now is not the time is also an answer. And he knows timing better than we do. Now is not the time. Maybe yes in a week. Maybe yes in a month. Maybe yes in a year. Now is not the time is an answer. Don't say he didn't answer you. Just because he didn't do it in your timetable. The nobleman can say that too. Sixthly, the whole issue of the signs and wonders. Demanding a sign in addition to validate our faith in verse 48. The Lord rebukes that. And then seventh, it's okay. In fact, it's probably a good idea to validate your faith. God is not interested in just hocus pocus. Our faith is rooted in truth, in fact, in reality. 
And so if we're sharing the gospel with someone and they want, they've got questions from the Bible, answer their questions, and I don't mind any question as long as they let me answer it from the Bible. See? I'm, not gonna, I don't, I'm not interested in answers outside of the Bible in the area of speculation. As long as I can answer it from the Bible, that's what I'm gonna, how I'm going to answer their questions because that's what we know as fact and reality, right? So we realize then, what hour <laughs> did that happen? By the way, if it's dependent on Roman reckoning or Jewish reckoning, I think they're still here in Jewish reckoning, so that'd be 1 o'clock in the afternoon. The day began at 6 a.m. I think that's more likely than 7 a.m. Roman time. But either way, he's saying, what hour? When did it actually happen? Well, the interest the man has in his son that's dying the father son picture sets up what happens in the next chapter in chapter 5 John's the only one that records this instrument of the nobleman and his son by the way it's only in the gospel of John aren't you glad we got all four gospels they complement each other too so father we thank you O Lord for the word of God the person of Jesus Christ we thank you that he was so committed to his mission and to finishing his work that he did it. He did it completely. He did it perfectly. And you praised him for it, as we'll see in chapter 12. Mm -hmm. So we thank you, O Lord. What a glory he is. And as we start this new year, this first day of the week, happens to be a first day of the calendar year in 2017, we ask, O Lord, that you would work in each of our hearts to learn these lessons and apply these principles in our own life. What a picture of what it is to be children of the Most High God. What a privilege. Be with us as we travel home. Give journeying mercies, particularly those traveling all the way to Baton Rouge. We're thankful for them to be here today. And we be with us as we join together tonight at Henderson in the will of the Lord. We thank you, O Lord. Receive our thanks as we offer in the Lord Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.